So um, I'm really excited that now it's my turn. I get to tell you about some of my work. I think that um, a number of you are, are familiar with some of the studies I'm going to present, um, but uh, hopefully I can frame it in a way that uh, is new and interesting, and I'll also pre present some new work that you uh, have not heard, uh, at least most of you. Um, and I want to really start with this notion of the default mode network. So it's come up several times uh, already today. And um, <clears throat> so I want to start out by first kind of just telling you a little bit about it. And I'm going to focus on what we've learned about the potential role of the DMN in aesthetic experience. And I guess one reason this is interesting, um, well, first of all, I guess before I get to that, is here is just um, uh, kind of a definition of the default mode network. So it's a highly interconnected network of brain regions that, and uh, I, I guess I should say that, that seem to or that the evidence suggests support self-referential internally focused mental processing. And I'll show just a few uh, uh, bits of information uh, that support that claim. And uh, it was actually originally discovered as a set of regions that are typically suppressed during a wide variety of tasks when compared to a resting baseline. So these are uh, uh, chunks of brain tissue that repeatedly across auditory studies or visual studies or tactile studies or attention studies seem to be the negative activation blobs in fMRI that no one knew what to do with. And uh, Marcus Rakel was really one of the first people to identify, wait a second, these blobs look like they're the same places across all these different domains. What's going on here. Maybe this isn't just a fluke. Maybe this, this set of brain regions is really doing something. And he did something very smart, which is that he then used PET to actually investigate the uh, uh, metabolism of the brain. And he found that these brain regions are actually really metabolically active during these states. So it's not just some weird artifact of imaging, but it really is the case that these brain regions are consuming a lot of energy uh, uh, during uh, these, these states. Okay, and I guess one another question might be why is this interesting? Um, I mean, this isn't the, the best gauge of interest perhaps, but clearly it is the case that a lot of people care about the DMN just by, uh, if we look at the number of publications uh, over the past 10 years with default mode network or default network in the, in the title. And I guess um, why I think this is interesting, from the fMRI perspective, the DMN is really a bit of a darling of fMRI research in that it's one of the discoveries that came out of fMRI research that, that for which, you know, maybe somebody had a, had a clue from the animal research, but but I think a lot of people really did not see the parallel or an analog in the animal research, and so it really was made kind of a big splash uh, within the fMRI uh, uh, community. Um, and then, more importantly. Uh, malfunctions of the DMN have been implicated in a variety of attention and mood disorders, and this is why the clinical community cares so much about the DMN. Okay, so what is it? Um, so it was originally identified as a task-negative network that was anti-correlated with regions of the brain that are engaged by attentionally demanding external tasks. So this image from um, uh, the Fox et al. 2005 paper identified a task-positive network, which are the warm colors here that um, uh, this was not a visual task, so the visual regions are not active, but if it were a visual task, you would see the, the back of the brain active as well um, uh, here in the occipital pole. Uh, but here you see that there are um, a variety of, of uh, uh, brain regions that are involved in the active deployment of attention to external objects in the environment. And then the DMN regions, which are in the cool colors, are these regions that seem to be anti-correlated. So when, they looked at, when you look at time courses of these large brain scale networks, you see that one tends to be up or the other tends to be up. And so they kind of seem to operate in this uh, uh, kind of seesaw faction, uh, fashion. And as I already mentioned, uh, these are some of the energetically most active regions in the brain. And they're also observed in tasks that you might call as mind wandering. So if you have people just go about their daily life and, and uh, do all kinds of weird things, uh, you know, they, they, diary studies have documented when people are mind wandering. If you put people in a scanner and, and ask them, uh, you know, are you on task or not on task, or you try to assay whether or not they're actually paying attention to the task or they're thinking about something else, the DMN seems to be regions of the brain that, that are active when people report that they were actually off task, that they were thinking about what they were having for breakfast the morning, that morning, uh, very much along the lines of some of the things that Moshe described. Um, and uh, I should note that, that the DMN is seen both in resting state analyses, so that is uh, when you collect data of a person with no specific task and then you use a technique like independent component analyses to actually uh, uh, look for spatially coherent patterns, the DMN is a dominant one. You also see it when you analyze task data. So when you take a large database of different cognitive tasks, the DMN is a coherent set of networks, a, co a coherent set of regions that comes out of these analyses. 
And then um, the last thing I'll, I'll tell you about is um, a paper by Anders Hanna. Uh, he, uh, actually, I think she actually, I'm not positive, um, uh, they um, uh, did some studies uh, where they were trying to understand what actually, what tasks actually engaged the DMN. And among the tasks that engaged the DMN um, in, were included things related to prospective thinking, thinking about tomorrow, think, and also retrospective thinking, thinking about the past, autobiographical memories, and particularly contrasts like thinking about the self and what I'm going to do tomorrow versus what someone else might be doing tomorrow. So there really is a component of self-reflection or uh, internally directed mentation that is critical for DMN activation. And they also, what I'm illustrating here, identified that the DMN is not a, just a monolithic entity, but it's composed of uh, these two hub regions, the AMPFC and the PCC, as well as a more uh, ventral set of regions that include the VMPFC, uh, uh, Peripacampal regions and uh, inferior parietal uh, lob, lobule, excuse me, and then also what they call the dorsal medial region here in blue that includes the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, temporal pole, uh, uh, sorry, temporal parietal junction, and uh, uh, lateral temporal cortex. <clears throat> okay, so um, what I'm going to tell you about today are three, experience, three experiments that, uh, uh, first of all, the first experiment is the experiment that, that even made me interested in the DMN as it relates to aesthetics in the first place. And then I'll tell you about two subsequent uh, experiments where we've tried to probe deeper what the actual role of DMN is in aesthetic experience. Okay. <clears throat> So um, with uh, Gabby Starr and Nava Rubin, we were interested in understanding whether or not there's a unique brain state associated with aesthetic experience. And we were not the first person to ask this question, um, uh, but uh, we went about it with, in a particular manner. Um, so we uh, showed people a wide variety of artworks. We uh, asked, uh, asked them uh, to give a, a response um, on an initial view, a first view of an artwork. We used a wide variety of artworks uh, in the, the, the thought that if there are individual differences in what people like, maybe we'll have something for everyone in this stimulus set. You may personally not like most of them, but maybe we'll at least find something in there that you really find aesthetically appealing. Um, and the instructions we gave to subjects were these. Um, uh, and the, 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 the kind of take home message here is that we ask people to respond on the basis of how much this image moves you, regardless of whether or not it is you know, beautiful, strange, or even ugly. So it could move you because you find it powerful, pleasing, or profound. So these instructions are somewhat complex, but they were our way of getting at a summary judgment of the effect that an aesthetic experience is not always merely beauty, it's not always merely positive. We can like material that is challenging, we can like material that is difficult, we can like material that is even negatively valence, but we may walk away from it saying, wow, that really blew me away. And some people may describe that experience as beautiful, but we were a bit worried that our subjects, at least in the US, may use use beauty as a, as a stand-in for pretty. And uh, therefore, we, we wanted them to really understand that we were trying to get them to describe their internal subjective experience and not something about the stimulus per se. Um, OK. And uh, OK, so the, what I want to first show you is uh, an interesting behavioral finding from this, this work, which is that when we ask people which paintings they find to be aesthetically moving, we find that people are radically uh, idiosyncratic. Uh, it's not that there's no common mode here. This is what this is showing is a, a, an agreement measure across people. This is different from the one that I will show you in later uh, slides. This one is, is the pairwise across observer correlation. So if two people have exactly the same preferences, they would be um, a point in the histogram over here at one. If they were perfectly anti-correlated, they would be at negative one. So here we see that, that the distribution uh, it straddles zero and slits, sits slightly to the right. So the average correlation between any two pairs of observers is 0.1, which tells you that you have a little bit of predictability for a visual art from one person to the next, but it's extremely, extremely low. Uh, uh, the, in, at least for this stimulus set, in this question, uh, the responses are really dominated by individual differences. And this actually has a methodological advantage for us, which is that um, any one image may be the most preferred, may, may get the highest rating on a, we used a one to four scale, um, uh, may get the highest rating from some subjects, but the lowest rating by other subjects, and vice versa. We can find a different image that this subject liked, but this subject uh, did not like. And the methodological advantage this gives us is that when we then average our data across multiple observers, the activations that we identify um, uh, are correlated with the aesthetic experience and not with any particular stimulus factor. So it's not just the case that some blob in the brain is really just reflecting that people like faces more than they like houses, and, and so uh, we're just seeing an activation that is being driven by that. Okay, So we at least know that the, um, 
uh, the blobs we're getting are to at least a first approximation not being driven solely by uh, differences in stimulus features. Okay. Uh, so um, in the back of the brain here, we see a few different activations, and I should note that the, the brain regions that we found um, have been reported by previous people as well, but I think really the power of this study was that we, we were able to see some interesting patterns across the different brain regions. So when we look at these regions that are more in the posterior part of the brain, this is a lateral view, a side view of your brain, this is an under view looking from the jaw, and then this is a slice through the brain as if you're looking head on, excuse me. And so these regions are in the, the more posterior half of the brain in the, the regions known as the ventral visual pathway. Uh, we see that there uh, seems to be a linear response where if I show you an image that you give the lowest rating a one, you still give a rating above zero. It's still a rating above looking at nothing, okay? Uh, sorry, this is not a rating, this is brain activity, my, my, my mistake. So the brain activity is greater than if you are looking at nothing, okay? Um, but then if you, I show you an image that you rate as a two, the brain activity is even higher and higher and higher. And we see a similar, though not quite as clean pattern in this uh, little patch here. In the striatum, um, our deeper brain region that is part of the uh, um, uh, basal ganglia, we see a pattern that actually straddles zero, such that paintings you rate as a one actually lead to deactivations, and paintings you rate as a four lead to activations. In the front part of the brain, however, we see, um, uh, uh, I'm gonna skip over that, we see a very different pattern, which is that um, this region here, the, the inferior frontal gyrus, pars triangularis, and this patch of the lateral orbital frontal cortex here, um, they don't show this linear pattern. In fact, paintings that are rated ones, twos, and threes produce uh, activation levels that are not actually very different from just looking at a blank wall. It's really only the paintings that are rated as fours that um, lead to this much uh, 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 this this big increase in activation. So we characterize this as more of a step function, and you know that is a, maybe a bit of a cartoon of what you're seeing here. But clearly, what it shows you is that there are two different processes going on here. There's one process that is giving an output for every image, and it is a graded response. And there's another process that is only giving an output for a subset of the images uh, at, that are given the top value. Um, okay, so uh, just as a, a check, we in early visual uh, cortex in this uh, data set, we did not find any differences across uh, the four response categories. Was just kind of a, a check that there did not seem to be visual differences that were driving the later activity differences we found. So um, now. Um, when this is the, the, the image that kind of really made me go wow in this data set, this is, a, this is a, um, a, a contrast of the four responses versus all of the trials. And when I first saw this, I kind of you know, characterized it as brain on fire. I mean, well, it's at least the medial wall. Uh, there seems to be a huge proportion of the medial wall that is responding most to, uh, much more to these four responses than to the others. And that really you know, drove home this message that we're dealing with some kind of a threshold process here that's really activating a lot of regions of the brain. Um, and what caught my attention is the fact that we see so much of this medial wall, and when you look at the image here of this, uh, the, the data from these regions, the MP MPFC and the PCC, you see that in fact, for one, twos, and threes, you get deactivations below baseline, and then when people rate something as highly moving, we actually get a rebound back up towards the resting baseline, the level that they would normally report, or sorry, the, the brain response we would normally see when they're looking at a blank wall, uh, when they're looking at a blank screen, or when they're doing nothing. Uh, when they're looking at nothing. Um, and so this uh, actually was, I'd seen this in other data, but it hadn't really been called attention. So for example, in the Kawabata and Zeki study in 2004, they also show that deactivations, they're actually showing less deactivations, not activations in these brain regions. And this really caught my attention that no one had really drawn, like, drawn attention to this fact before, that we were actually looking at less deactivations in this part of the brain, not activations, and that it might be meaningful. And you know, since I knew some of the literature on the DMN, it really uh, made me want to look at this closer. So here, I'm illustrating the data in a different fashion. Here, you're seeing um, the pattern of all the trials that were rated as ones versus uh, resting baseline. And coded in blue are those regions that actually show less uh, show, show negative signal. So what this means is that these are regions that are more active during rest than they are during looking at an image. And the, the, the bright colored regions are the regions that show more activation. So we see here that when you're looking at an image, there are regions of the brain that seem suppressed that match up very well with uh, previously published reports of the DMN. And this is not surprising at all. Um, the same is true for an image you rate as a two or an image you rate as a three. Um, so this, we see this typical anti-correlation between the DMN and uh, task positive regions. But when I show you an image that you rate as a four, it's not that the blue is completely gone, but it's dramatically reduced, particularly here in the medial prefrontal cortex, but also here in some of the PCC as well as on the lateral surface. 
And when we look at the signal from here, as you've already seen, uh, we can confirm that. And when we with, with, uh, extract some time courses, we get a hint here that the, the low-rated trials lead to uh, a um, decrease in activation, but the high-rated trials, maybe this is just a hint here, maybe lead to a little bit of initial decrease, but then a positive increase, which when you model it with a canonical hemodynamic response ends up being around zero. Okay. So anti-correlated networks become active. We think that this might be a rare state and, might, and potentially it's a hallmark of aesthetic processing uh, and that the engagement of internally focused mentation may be a key characteristic that distinguishes aesthetic appreciation from pleasure. Um, and I think that you know, Dennis really liked this finding and uh, what, you know, it was definitely an inspiration I think for some of the studies that NA did. Um, but here I wanna give a caveat before I go on, um, which is that the role of the DMN is unclear. Right? The, the DMN in this data really grabbed my attention because it seemed really interesting and counterintuitive, but we don't really know what it's doing, and it's quite possible that it may not be doing the heavy lifting. Right? It may be that, that we know that the ventral striatum or we know that portions of the orbital frontal cortex may be actually mediating more of the, the felt pleasure and the, the conscious perception of pleasure. Um, uh, so it's unclear exactly what it is that the DMN is doing and whether or not it's doing anything at all that is actually relevant for aesthetic experiences or is merely just coming along for the ride and reporting that there's something relevant out there in the world. Um, and, but what, so what caught my eye again is the uncharacteristic nature. So today I want to kind of give you a bit of a progress report on, on, on you know, trying to answer some of these questions of can we clarify to some degree the actual role of the DMN. And to give you an answer, I'm not very far yet, so I can't give you an answer yet, but at least you'll hopefully get some tantalizing details. Um, all right, so the basic picture here is that um, visual regions, of uh, uh, sensory regions are active when you have an external focus on visual perception, and then the DMN regions are active when you have an internal focus on thinking, but that during um, a uh, moving aesthetic experience, both external and internal networks are engaged. So that's our kind of toy model right now. Okay, so now I'm gonna skip to um, a project, a more recent project, uh, where we've been trying to explore the dynamics of these processes. So, and this is a uh, uh, work in collaboration with Amy Belfi, with Anna Brillman, uh, Ilka Isik, uh, Anjan Chatterjee, Helmut Later, Dennis Pelly, and Gabby Starr. So um, if you look at a painting, uh, your experience of this painting changes over time. So when you first look at this painting, you may mostly see that it's like a, a landscape with a large amount of rock, and then you may pretty quickly notice that there's a little dude up here. And uh, if you have any knowledge of classical mythology, you may you know, realize that this is Prometheus. And if you look really hard, and if the projector contrast is good enough, you can maybe start to see that the, um, uh, the I forget what the creature is, is it a, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's an eagle, is basically flying up here to the rock to start picking out his uh, uh, innards, right? That's Prometheus's, uh, 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 um, uh, his, his, his punishment is to, to be repeatedly uh, uh, disemboweled by an eagle on a rock. Um, and so your experience of this painting unfolds in time, even though the stimulus itself is not changing. So we were interested in understanding what the temporal dynamics of network responses are during aesthetic experiences. And just to um, uh, go back here, you know, we have this initial uh, uh, hint of, of, of the dynamics. Um, and one thing that this tells us, both from our work and also from the work of, of Dennis and Anna, is that the dynamics of aesthetic experience may actually be slow enough to capture with fMRI. There are many processes where you would basically just immediately switch to MEG if you really want to care about dynamic processes. But it, the matter of the fact is that many aspects of aesthetic experience take place on the order of seconds rather than on the order of milliseconds. And that's not to say there aren't interesting things to study on the order of milliseconds, but there are also some interesting things to study about aesthetic experiences that take place on the order of seconds and even tens of seconds, right, minutes. Okay, so we think we can capture some information. Uh, and uh, importantly, we're interested in understanding whether or not there might be a potential separation of this initial suppression versus later activation. That was kind of an, an, an additional question we had. So again, we use artwork, and the paradigm this time uh, is that a person sees a brief fixation point. They see an artwork, and this time the, the duration of the artwork is variable. It's either one second, five seconds, or 15 seconds. Um, and... Uh, then after the image, there's a 14 second d delay period where there's nothing on the screen. And this was uh, inspired by NA's work because we really wanted to have a period where we could uh, potentially uh, track a little bit of the ongoing evolution of the pleasure response even though the stimulus is not there anymore, right? And we want to be able to, to kind of like measure the, the changes in the network after the actual experience is over. 
Um, so during this whole period, people are using a squeeze ball to make a continuous rating of pleasure. They basically squeeze harder uh, to their maximum if they're experiencing maximum pleasure, and then they let go if they're experiencing le less pleasure. And after this period here, they can stop squeezing. Then, at the very end, they make an overall judgment, and rather than using a discrete scale, we use a little continuous scale, so they use a trackball to move a slider uh, back and forth in this, in this interval to lock in their uh, overall uh, response. And the, the, the questions were framed very similar to the way that they were in, in the study Anna mentioned, which is that this was phrased as a continuous enjoyment or continuous pleasure liking response. And then this was kind of an overall summati summative measure of uh, whether or not the experience was aesthetically moving. Okay, so first um, I'm gonna just briefly show you uh, uh, some analysis of the behavioral data. These are fits using NA's model to the uh, sh uh, shortest one second, five second, and 15 second trials. The time the uh, image is on is in the gray bar here. And you can see that her model is a very good fit. And in general, the, the shape is similar regardless of the uh, uh, image duration. You can see there's maybe a little bit more of a plateau here by the time you get to the longer duration stimuli. And then, then uh, in these stimuli, you're actually able to see a bit more of the offset response. Whereas for the short durations, you, you really only see, you don't see as much of that uh, plateau. Um, so it's well fit by this model uh, with a fast exponential onset and a fast plus slow exponential decay. Um, and uh, this parameter, R steady, which they uh, uh, extract from their model, which is basically the, um, the, the, a value that says what with the continued stimulation things will settle to, so kind of this value here, uh, this, they can extract this parameter from the model um, and it uh, describes the amplitude of the pleasure response very well. Um, now if we look at the different networks here, I'm gonna walk you through this, this data. Um, so first if we look at um, uh, the lateral visual network. So this is not early visual, this is actually more like um, uh, a bit more mid-level visual regions. Um, you see that um, there is a visual response that's dominated by a visual response. And here in the 15 second and a little bit in the five second, we do actually see some time points where we actually see a little bit of a difference uh, between the high, medium, and low. But it's quite small, and in general, the response is what you would expect for a visual response. And you even see this um, a kind of initial transient followed by more of a plateau in the 15 second stimulus. For the basal ganglia, um, we uh, see a response that um, is uh, overall deviates much less from zero than the visual response does, uh, but it shows, uh, here it was um, not significant in the time point by time point measure, but I'm sure if we fit this with an HRF it would be significant. We see this ordering of high, medium, low uh, for all three trials, and here in the 15 second you can see that the response is actually really coming. Uh, kind of uh, not long after the beginning of the image and then kind of collapses back down. And we even see this strange reversal here in the uh, offset period after the image has disappeared. <laughs> and then lastly in the DMN, um, we see um, uh, this pattern. So uh, when uh, you see an image for one second, we see a higher response for the preferred, the high versus the medium and low. Now here in the five second, this is interesting to look at the comparison between these two. So here, these look like they are, uh, they could be activations above baseline. Here, what we're seeing are these deactivations below baseline and then less deactivation for the um, uh, high rated trial. But we're still seeing this ordering between high, medium, and low. And there's even a hint of what, of what we saw in the, in the previous data set, which is that um, the medium and low are very close to each other and mainly it's the high that's different. And then in the 15 second things, th things are a bit more complicated. It looks like the, it, uh, it's a bit noisier here at the beginning, but then we do hit a point where we get this ordering here. But now this ordering of high, medium, and low is actually quite a bit below baseline. And then we see this very strong rebound here. So um, let me try to deep, uh, kind of unpack this uh, response profile. So first of all, uh, at the five second duration, we think we're seeing a pretty good replication of the results of the earlier study, that there are deactivations that are uh, less, uh, less deactivation and maybe even a slight positive activation for the high preferred trials. Um, we're seeing modulation by aesthetic appreciation in the DMN in the first few seconds. Um, here there's maybe a bit of a hint that it happens later, but it's not really clear whether or not there's much of a specific delay here. We're really seeing this modulation relatively early tied to the beginning of the uh, onset of the stimulus. And this is superimposed on top of a suppression, a suppressive effect that grows longer with longer image duration. So the longer the image is on, the more suppression, the longer the suppression lasts. 
so the way you can really see this is if you look at the medium trials, um, you can see that um, the, the, the medium trials here and the, the low as well are suppressed here, and that suppression gets longer, and then here the suppression is even longer, right? Okay, and then interestingly, in the 15-second duration, we see this rebound of the DMN signal late in the trial for low preferred images. So this, this red curve really rebounds, and notice it's rebounding actually even before the image is off the screen. And what we think is happening here is, uh, can be a little bit better seen if we take this data and we realign it by the image offset. So this, this is the same data from the DMN, but we've realigned it to the time when the image turn, goes off the screen rather than when the image turns on the screen. Um, and so here, what I want to call your attention to is uh, here in this red arrow here, you can see that unlike in the, um, uh, the low and the medium, in the high preferred trials, the signal change in the DMN is time locked to image on offset, meaning that all these curves kind of collapse back down to baseline at the same time, okay? And that's not what we see here. The image turns off and these curves don't converge back down onto the baseline at the same time. So they appear to not be time locked. <clears throat> and so what we think this might mean is that actually in these low and medium trials, we're actually getting an earlier return to stimulus-independent thought. People are no longer being engaged by the stimulus, and so the DMN is now doing something else. It's thinking about what you're going to have for lunch tomorrow. And I know this is a little bit counterintuitive, that sometimes the DMN goes up for aesthetic appeal, and sometimes it goes up for... Uh, uh, for disengagement. And so clearly DMN being up is not the sole signature of whether or not something is aesthetically appealing or not. It's much more complicated than that. Um, and so it's really about these network interactions. Um, here, I think the key is that we can say that, that it does seem that DMN being up at the same time that the stimulus is up, uh, like with, with a stimulus event, that that really seems to be more uh, uh, predictive of uh, uh, increased aesthetic appeal. Um, so, um, let me see here, was there one thing I was going to say about that? No, okay. Um, I may skip this for time. Um, so, uh, we looked at some of the subregions of the DMN, uh, and in general, I think I'll, and I'll show this. So, um, we looked at the DMPFC, AMPFC, and VMPFC, and PCC separately, and you can see that the effects are most present in the AMPFC and the PCC, which are the DMN core regions. It's actually not really present in the VMPFC, although I would note that our definition of VMPFC is perhaps a, uh, in, uh, a bit more caudal than uh, some people's. Uh, and then we see some, some echo of it in the DMPFC, and, and then this offset response is particularly strong in the DMPFC. So um, what we think here is going on here is, is a, a contrast versus the external dynamics of the stimulus versus the internal dynamics of the observer's state. And so it seems as if the DMN really plays a critical role in supporting the internal state of an observer during aesthetic experiences. So um, when it's the case, so first during the initial aesthetic response, the DMN can either be suppressed or it can be, uh, actually become engaged. And then in the continued engagement or disengagement from an artwork, depending upon the subjective aesthetic appreciation. So if a person is finding an artwork to be pleasing, the, the DMN tends to lock on to the stimulus more. Okay, so that's the general idea. Um, and I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I think I'm going to have to uh, really skip this last section or not give you too much detail. Um, I'll, maybe just I'll try to describe it in a few words instead of walking you through the slides and, be, and not leaving time for questions. Um, so in general, what we were interested in understanding was whether or not um, um, the uh, DMN uh, contains a domain general representation of aesthetic appeal or a domain specific representation of aesthetic appeal. So we were able to make uh, judgments about aesthetic appeal, about paintings or about landscapes or about uh, uh, dance, et cetera. And you can imagine that there are parts of the brain that represent the key features of these different regions. So we know that at some level, um, uh, the features of a landscape and the features of a, of a building are represented differently because they rely upon different feature sets to represent the complexity of, of the objects you're looking at. So uh, the question we were really interested in was whether or not when you move to the front part of the brain and start looking at regions that are sensitive to aesthetic appeal, um, uh, is there uh, a process that is representing people's aesthetic appeal that is universal or, or uh, general across these different domains? Um, and I really wish I had more time to show you this, but I always do this. I pack too much into a, a talk. Um, so um, um, let's see here. You can, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about, some of you know about this, so, uh, and, and you'll see it soon, I guess. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, all right, here's what I want to show you. So what we did 
is we use a, a machine learning classifier. And the goal of the machine learning classifier was to see if we could take brain activity and predict people's preferences. And the take home message here is that across these regions of the DMN, the DMN was actually quite good at predicting people's preferences, whether or not a stimulus was rated as high or low, um, uh, both within a domain, so if I train a classifier on art and test on art, and also across domains, so if I train a machine learning classifier on art but test on landscape. Okay? So that is a strong signature of a domain general process. It means that the pattern of activation that signals high versus low aesthetic appreciation in these regions is not specific to landscape or not specific to artwork, but it really is a general dom uh, uh, representation. Um, we also um, uh, tried to do some mapping to um, uh, look at, um, let's see here. We tried to do some mapping to try to identify domain-specific regions, and of course we found some. There are some regions of the brain that are domain-specific. Um, and the main take-home message I want to give for you, to you today is that the, the interesting nugget of that story is that um, these regions on the, in the medial prefrontal cortex, on the medial wall, seem to really be involved in this domain general process. And then there are some regions that kind of wrap it just a bit more forward, uh, right on the frontal pole of the brain that seem to only be involved uh, for judgments or that seem to only contain information that is relevant for judgments of architecture and artwork. And so this is a very tentative conclusion, but what we think might be going on here is that when you make judgments about artifacts of human culture, that is, uh, things that humans have made versus natural kinds like landscapes, that your brain has to record ad recruit additional resources in order for you to make those types of judgments. And uh, again, I apologize for not having time to walk you through that story in more detail, but I wanted to focus on the other work. Um, okay, so in general, we see um, uh, a domain general representation of aesthetic appreciation in the DMN, which passes a strong test for domain generality. Uh, we think it's part of a core system of uh, aesthetic appreciation evaluation. And then we found additional domain-specific prefrontal resources that are recruited for artifacts of human culture. So to summarize my uh, uh, progress report on the DMN, um, we think that it's activated by moving aesthetic experience with visual artwork. We think it becomes locked to high appreciation stimuli and disengages for low appreciated stimuli and therefore supports the internal state of an observer during such an experience. This still doesn't really answer the question of whether or not it's critical or required, but it definitely gives us a bit more information about what role it is playing and it rules out some things. And lastly, I think this is really important that it contains information that can be used to decode aesthetic appeal in a domain general manner. So whatever it is that the DMN is doing, Doing, it has a cop, even if it didn't generate it, the DMN contains the information within it that is that reliably uh, can encode and therefore we can decode uh, the aesthetic appeal that people are feeling for uh, specific trials. So uh, with that, I will finish. And of course, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the people who did this work with me. Um, and oh my, this is the outdated acknowledgement slide. There's a lot of people who are missing. Um, uh, Gabby Starr, uh, Jonathan Stahl, my uh, former team at uh, NYU, Amy Belfi and uh, Ilkay Isik uh, uh, here at uh, MPI, and M Amy has now um, moved on to um, uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology. Um, and then uh, the team uh, uh, that worked in the, as part of the GIS project uh, that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you.